Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, peanuts, Oscar, and signs. Snoopy's got a new show on Apple TV+. Plus. You are lovers. What? Did he tell you I was pregnant? What? Touchstone Then we turn back the clock the and the look at when Sylvester Stallone made his first out-and-out out comedy. And some Jordanians are sick of Oman's increasingly updated look, so a museum is giving them a bit of nostalgia. Snoopy and his friends aren't just getting a new home on Apple TV+. They're getting a whole Peanuts cinematic universe with their first full-length series since the 1980s. Wow! Can you believe this dog? Marcy, remind me to never pick that kid with the big nose for gym class. <laughs> Thanks for the inspiration, Snoopy. There's appeal because the comic strip and the characters represent a humanity that is embodied in all of us. Our hopes, our fears, our tears, our laughter. And so we all recognize that. And it's now given back to us through this new animated special in, in an in a animation that's fresh and new and yet still embodies all these characteristics that people recognize and love. Charlie Brown, I can't tell who has the rounder head. That snowman or you? Hmm. Nope, can't tell. Good grief. Let's talk to film critic Steven Silva, who joins me from Philadelphia. Hi there, it's lovely having you with us today. So, the Snoopy Hi, show. So it is very Big close to the original. Sorry, Stephen. So, uh, it is very close to the original. Do you think that is a good thing? I think it is, yeah. And I, I feel like uh, they really uh, wanted to get back to what people love about Peanuts and Snoopy. And uh, they're doing a lot of things with... Uh, the, the style of it looks very similar to the old cartoons that uh, everybody knows and loves. Okay, now that you mentioned, uh, you know, what people love about Snoopy, I want you to talk a little bit about that. What makes Snoopy <laughs> so uh, still relevant and loved? Well, I think, you know, uh, it's a kid, it's a dog, it's a group of friends who are kids, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. And uh, another big uh, aspect of uh, Peanuts and Snoopy that people love is just the nostalgia. Just watching a new Snoopy show, it, it reminds you of, you know, your youth, whether it was Christmas time or whether it was Halloween, watching the special and, uh, you know, bringing back the feelings of that you might remember from uh, when you watched it when you were a kid. So, Stephen, what kind of viewer do you think this show is for? Do you think it's for adults who used to enjoy it or can this open up to new audiences? Well, um, it, get, it has the G rating in the United States, which is for the, you know, indicates that it's for kids. And that, that really, I think, is the main uh, focus of what they're going for in terms of audience. Um, but I do know that uh, it doesn't really, a lot, a lot of kids' shows will kind of put in, you know, inside jokes for adults. And this show doesn't really do much of that. It's more, uh, I mean, it, it'll appeal to the nostalgia factor and it'll appeal to, uh, you know, adults who love uh, these characters. But um, overall, I think uh, kids are the main uh, audience for this. Okay, Stephen, uh, kids' shows have become... Uh, a major battleground for streaming services. And I want to hear what you have to say about this because, you know, they don't really come up with brand new shows or brand new uh, stories, but then they really bring, try to bring back old kids shows. What was it that they were doing so well that we still need them? If you've ever had kids, and I have two boys, um, they, they really love to watch. They find characters that they kind of glom onto and they really watch it over and over and over again and it ends up uh you know a lot of a lot of these uh streaming services they measure things by uh you know time spent on it and i know that uh 
kids will just sit in front of the TV for hours and hours watching SpongeBob or Dora the Explorer or characters like that that they love. And so I know that uh, Paramount Plus Paramount Plus is about to launch uh, internationally. Uh, it's known as CBS All Access in the United States. And I know Dora the Explorer and SpongeBob are both big parts of that. And uh, you know HBO Max has Sesame Street. Um, that was a big deal when uh, HBO got Sesame Street, which has always been on PBS in the U.S. So and then Apple, you know, has Snoopy, and uh, they just announced a new deal for uh, some new animated movies. So these shows for kids, they might not uh, be the headline, they might not get as much attention as, you know, The Mandalorian or shows like that, but they really are um, an underrated part of the future when it comes to uh, this type of stuff. Okay, so the Snoopy show overall, would you recommend it? Is it watchable? Do you like it? I do. I do like it, and I do think they did a good job with it. I think that they they emphasized the familiar and they emphasized uh, the things that uh, people like about Peanuts and people like about Snoopy. And I feel like they got that right. If they hadn't really gotten the what Snoopy's all about or what Peanuts is all about correctly, then that would have been not so great. But uh, they, they seem to have gotten it right. So I do feel like I do recommend this and I do think it's something that people should watch. All right, Stephen Silver, it was lovely having you with us today. Thanks a lot. Sylvester Stallone is an action icon, but in 1991, he changed lanes to make a 1930s-style comedy. We open up our movie almanac and take you back to the film. Oscar. By the way you look, I can see you have no experience in war, do you? I fired a few shots. Rocky and Rambo made Sylvester Stallone a global superstar. So Snap's Provolone stands out as a unique entry in his filmography. In the past, Stallone did mix humor into his movies, but 1991's Oscar puts him squarely in the center of a comedic role for the first time. Because you do it for me. The year is 1931. Provolone is a mafia boss trying to go straight to fulfill his father's dying wish. At the same time, he tries to find a husband for his pregnant daughter. Et si tu continues à faire autant de bruit, je te mettrai pensionnaire dans une institution religieuse. Oscar is the remake of a 1967 French film. This version has comedian Louis de Funès playing a businessman who's also having similar trouble with his offspring. John Landis took the idea and ran with it creating a tribute to the American screwball comedies of the 1930s. To anchor his movie, he told the press he needed a star, explaining that the 1930s had big names, like Edward G. Robinson and James Cagney, and that he believed the cultural icon of the 1990s was Stallone. My name is Julius. I'm your twin brother. Obviously. A few years earlier, Arnold Schwarzenegger tried his hand at comedy with twins, and it was a financial success. However, studio executives had concerns regarding Stallone doing comedy. His brother. The twins. That's right. She'll do anything. Their worries were put to bed by the critics. Gene Siskel called the movie a truly funny work by enormously talented people. He and his fellow critic Roger Ebert gave the movie the two thumbs up. Variety chimed in, calling it an amusing throwback to the gangster comedies of Golden Age Hollywood. Nevertheless, those votes of confidence were met with critics who thought differently and Stallone was given a Razzie nomination for his acting. But this still doesn't change the fact that Oscar takes its place in history as a bold move of an action star, testing the waters of full-on comedy. Sylvester Stallone, Oscar. Not too long ago, the city of Amman was devoid of modern buildings. But some people living there say they long for the old look of the town. So, a new museum is trying to give them what they've been missing. Jordanian calligrapher Hassan Abu Neme says it's a bit sad to see modern signs dotted across his city of Amman. He says they are practical, but far less beautiful. 
70 years ago, the shops, hotels, and libraries looked different. They were adorned with Arabic calligraphy. The handwritten script was used at first as a religious calling, and then as a tool for architecture, design, and decoration. In Amman's case, Jordanians used the 2,000-year-old tradition to decorate their storefronts. While that tradition is slowly fading away, old signs from the 1940s to the 1990s can now be seen at the Amman Signs Museum. The founder says he wants to preserve the legacy of the Jordanian capital of old and embrace Arabic calligraphy. The place in general is an expression of gratitude for Arabic calligraphy and an expression of gratitude to the calligraphers who made these signs. We also have a library that has books about calligraphy. Tao started collecting signs more than three decades ago. Last year, he brought his collection together and turned it into a museum. It serves as a bit of comfort for people like Maisa Manazra. I'm visiting downtown with my children to show them some places in the area. And this is one of the places that attracted me because it can show them what Amman looked like in the past. In here, I saw some familiar signs to me. It brought back old memories. Taub said he always thought classic signs would disappear with digitalization or modernization. And that served as an impetus to start his museum. But lately, Taub is feeling much more positive. He describes his museum now as a thank you letter to the calligraphy masters who've transformed his city into what it is today. Kinetic art was popularized after World War II. That is, unless you're Russian. The movement never found its footing in the Soviet Union. But a new exhibition is trying to make up for that. Nursen Atutar has more. Moscow's Tretyakov Gallery stimulates its visitors with the exhibition Laboratory of the Future – Kinetic Art in Russia. Around 400 works incorporate some kind of movement. This is called Kinetic Art, and the curator says it's been neglected in Russia's contemporary art scene. If you open any book written on the history of art by our researchers, you will see that only one and a half pages are dedicated to kinetic art, and sometimes it is missed out altogether. Our exhibition shows first of all new names, presents works of well-known artists who were forgotten, and follows the absolutely new link of art development between avant-garde, contemporary and experiments of the 1960s. There are four sections in the exhibition, all dedicated to different dynamics in the kinetic art movement. Color tables delve into the color perceptions. Art metrics demonstrate works based on calculations. Laboratory of Environment displays works in the field of design and performing arts. And the final section, Synesthesia, mixes several senses together. For very many artists, it's interesting to explore this particular opportunity, to look at different ways of perception, to expand the boundaries of perception, and to start hearing the visible, to see the hearable, to touch both. In this sense, this technology that lets us hear the color or see the sound, it becomes a very interesting object of artistic investigation. During the Soviet Union, art movements such as avant-garde and social realism were popular. Now the curators of this exhibition hope that kinetic art will inject some fresh blood into the Russian contemporary art scene. We'd like you to meet Emerson Bukhari. He's been a professional musician in Sierra Leone. And when he's not singing, he's a vocal critic against corruption. 
He says after three successive governments, the situation continues to get worse. <laughs> okay, we don't begin, we don't start panel. Fine girl chilling in my bedroom. Big meeting. Nine Lives is Emerson Bokhari's latest album. It includes a song called Coconut Ed, which in 14 minutes describes, in Bokhari's words, everything wrong with Sierra Leonean politics. Bokhari knows some people might find it offensive. After all, he makes fun of voters for electing bad politicians. But he believes it's a hard truth that will change lives. We've been crying for 59 years. <laughs> we deserve better. Whatever is happening between the political parties, it's not our concern. Their fights, it's not our concern. All we are asking for is a better Sierra Leone. We are asking whatever it takes for them to sit on that round table, talk the politics, talk, talk and understand themselves for the better, better, betterment of all Sierra Leoneans. Now, Sierra Leone has two major political parties the Sierra Leone People's Party and All People's Congress. They've traded power back and forth since 1961. And allegations of partisanship and corruption have been rampant. Things got so bad that a civil war broke out between 1991 and 2002. There are a path in the past that we've taken that has led us, led us to even the, the civil war that we had and we're taking the same paths over and over again and i keep reminding us that it is not a good path for us we have to take paths that um benefits sierra leoneans as a whole 2002 is also the year when bokari began making music his 2007 album two foot arata is even credited for influencing that year's election results. In 2018, he was condemned by former president Ernest Bai Koroma. So Bokari left town and moved to Nigeria. He's lived there for the last two years, but he remains frustrated with his homeland's chronic problems. I do not want people to go through the same things that I went through. Like I suffered as a kid, you know, growing up as a kid, and it, it hurts my heart, it pains me to see little kids wake up in the morning before they go to school. They will have to walk like miles, miles to go fetch water. And it's, 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 it's heartrending for me, you know. This is the 21st century, for God's sake. We're not asking for the world, we're just asking for basic, basic amenities like pipe on water. Emerson Bokari might feel frustrated, but he continues to sing. And while he hopes his lyrics will inspire politicians to change, he believes that will only happen once the people demand more from them. The build-up from discarded face masks has become an environmental crisis. So, a student in South Korea is turning them into furniture. Nursen Atutar has more. This three-legged stool is made out of 1,500 face masks. A 23-year-old furniture design student in South Korea makes them. Kim Ha Nyul says the masks protect humans from the COVID-19 virus, but in return, humans should protect the world from the waste the masks produce. Plastic is recyclable. Plastic is recyclable, but why don't we recycle face masks, which are made of plastic? I was doubtful about why masks are being incinerated. So as a person who makes furniture, I wanted to show we can recycle them. Kim asks students at his university to donate their used face masks. He gathered around 10,000 of them. Then, a local face mask factory gave him a ton more, and he set to work. But how is this not a dangerous endeavor? How does he stay safe whilst working with used face masks? 
It keeps them in storage for four days and then melts them at 300 degrees Celsius to prevent any contamination. This disposable face mask that we wear is made from elastic bands, wire and filters. These filters that I use are polypropylene, which is recyclable plastic. I melted down filters and transformed them into this hard form as a test. Based on this method, I use this mold and make these legs and then complete the stool. According to the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, in November alone, South Korea manufactured more than 600 million face masks. And if not recycled, the polypropylene in the masks takes hundreds of years to break down. The stools have such a strong message. If I bought one, I think it would remind me of what we've been through in 2020 with the coronavirus. They will also remind us to take care of the environment, since they are made from recycled face masks. He has made 15 stools so far, and they're gaining interest from his fellow schoolmates. Other students who see his display at the campus gallery are offering to buy one. But Kim has bigger plans. I hope the government and companies will take concrete measures, like setting up separate boxes for collecting face masks. As an artist, I will also recycle leftover pieces of face masks from factories and make a series of furniture, such as a chair, lighting, or table. This is my goal. This has all started as a school project for a graduation exhibition. Though the stools which Kim calls Stack and Stack have grown beyond that. He's now trying to collaborate with companies to create a furniture line made with face masks. He says his goal is not money, but working for the environment. While many museums have been organizing virtual tours since COVID-19 broke out, others want to introduce you to a docent with a few screws loose. Zeynep Gökte has the story. It all started in 2014 when Tate Britain allowed visitors to explore its art galleries at night via remote-controlled robots. Not so long after, the Van Abba Museum in the Netherlands started doing the same as a way to help out art enthusiasts with physical disabilities who weren't able to visit their space. But ever since COVID-19 came into the picture, these telepresence robots are attracting more museums that want to offer more than just a virtual tour, but a real-time experience. Miami's Avant Gallery is one of them. They invite you to jump into the body of their robots to explore their physical galleries. Same goes for the UK-based Hastings Contemporary. It's like video conferencing on a, on a Segway. Uh, so it looks like an I, iPad and it looks like a Segway and it moves around. It's actually uh, much more dexterous than it might first appear. So it has a zoom that can go in and out and a neck that extends up and down. And it can be manoeuvred on, on fairly level ground. Uh, very, very cap it's very capable. And you don't have to do it alone. Your family or friends can join you along the way. This robot can take five people, five screens, so five living rooms together on a tour around the gallery. That could be a classroom for schools, it could be a family group at home, or it could be one person by themselves, bedridden, who can jump on board via the robot, via their own computer screen, and allow us to drive them around the gallery, or indeed, one of them can be the driver. In this case, the driver was the museum's visitor services manager, Rowan Bunny. We're an art gallery and we're here to display what we have 
to our visitors. It's no substitute for seeing them in the real, but at least it it gives people the opportunity to get a bit of a, an insight and a, and a bit of a sneaky peek at, at what we've got on display. But even when COVID-19 is no longer a threat, Hastings Contemporary has no intention of ditching the robots. And that's not such a big surprise. Artificial intelligence is taking over more jobs for people. There are even plans for a robot to curate the next Bucharest Biennial in 2022. So maybe the coronavirus is not the only thing museum employees should be worried about. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of art and culture. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.